During the late 70s and early 80s, cable television began to rise in popularity, and with that came public access television. On public land, cable companies wanted the rights to lay down cable wires all throughout, so in exchange, allotted by the FCC, cable companies were contractually obligated to provide a percentage of their revenue to municipalities for the construction of media centers. At these centers, production of airtime began for public comment on PEG channels. It is noteworthy to add that these agreements and franchise fees varied among local municipalities. These agreements were designed to give everyday citizens a voice who otherwise would not have had the ability to do so. In 1984, the Cable Franchise Policy and Communications Act banned cable companies from interfering with any editorial control over public access channels through supporting the local franchise need, set a limit on franchise fees at 5% of gross revenues, and permitted city and town officials to need PEG channels, studios, and production equipment. Now, in terms of um, you know regulations, there you know there's there's federal regulations that sort of dictate how we operate. That's from a federal cable act of 1984, and then amended in 1992 and, and 1996. So we fall under under those edicts. But um, in terms of you know local uh, local regulatory support, it's been an extremely good relationship that we have with the city of Fall River. There's no doubt that community media is under attack potentially by the FCC. Um, they have before them a proposed uh, change in their rules which would dictate that the franchise fee which many of us in Massachusetts and across the country uh, rely on to provide our funding to provide these channels to, to our communities, um, they're, they're looking at changing through the rules to allow cable companies to use any of their in-kind services that they provide for the community and that could include things like our channels itself. If a community has a local office um, that will, will help with billing and customer service, which we do have in Fall River, and anything that it provides that would be part of its contract with the city, um, there's a potential that they can use that to offset the value of that to offset the money that they provide us for our community media channels. And that will be, and that is allowed to stand that would be devastating to community media across the country. Um, it would literally, uh, probably, could potentially be the death knell of our stations because even though we're mission driven, um, we do need funds to operate. And unfortunately for most of our stations, the franchise fee we receive from the cable company is our sole or primary source of revenue. And without that revenue coming in, allowing the community to have its voice on cable television uh, may likely go away. And that's something that we hope will not happen. Um, it is something that um, if the FCC rules in the coming months um, will probably be um, appealed in, in court. Um, so there may be some time to, to have that adjudicated, but it's definitely, we're definitely at a point in our history that there's no doubt that we're facing a threat that we've probably never faced before. And it's not just here in Massachusetts, it would be across the country where a lot of the funding for our operations is, uh, is in jeopardy, no doubt about it. Currently, there is an impending impact on communities and PEG channels. The FCC is suggesting to rule that all in-kind cable company tasks, other than PEG capital costs and build-out requirements, are franchise fees under the Cable Act and in return would count against the 5% franchise fee limit. In-kind contributions are broadly defined by the FCC. Therefore, it appears as if the FCC is trying to weaken the Cable Act's intent on offering franchise fees to communities for public use. Backhaul services, electronic program guides, the value of PEG channel capacity, and many other non-monetary things could potentially be charged back against franchise fees. Through decisions made by the cable industry, the charges back would then be at fair market value. At this rate, it is expected that in some areas, franchise fees might be stopped entirely.
We're fortunate in community media to have a national organization which advocates for our needs, the Alliance for Community Media. It's been around for over 40 years, uh, serving the needs of public education and government access television across the country. We also have a very strong organization here in Massachusetts through our uh, first used to be a chapter of the Alliance, now it's called Mass Access. They do a fantastic job in advocating for the PEG Access Centers in Massachusetts. I was uh, pleased to be a member of the Mass Access Board for many years. Now I currently serve on the Northeast Region Board of the Alliance for Community Media and also serve as that organization's representative on the Alliance for Community Media National Board. And for the past two years, again, been honored to be uh, elected chair of the National Board of, of the ACM. Uh, the ACM does a lot of public policy work, primarily nationally, to help preserve our industry and make sure that we're a vital, vibrant organization. Uh, but it also does a lot of work in the grassroots, helping promote community media and the aspects of it across the country. It's an organization, as I said, that's been around for over 40 years. And um, it, it's an organization where all of its members are really dedicated to the mission, the mission of providing community media within our communities. First of all, I think the ACM is incredibly important as a national organization that advances uh, the efforts of community media. They have a rich history in the industry and again, those visionary founders of uh, this this medium, this new sort of form of alternative media, um, you know, helped establish the uh, National Federation of Local Cable Programmers, which then became the ACM. And so um, the ACM provides support, uh, professional development opportunities, um, and basically helps this uh, coalition of, of organizations that serve all sorts of different communities of all sorts you know of different sizes and different needs uh, different staffing um, and kind of varying missions sometimes um, depending on whether they're uh, sort of government oriented or public oriented or education oriented they help them to deliver their mission uh, more effectively uh, so the ACM is extremely important in that way. Mass Access as a trade association um, has helped to um, bring community media stations in Massachusetts uh, up to a elevated sort of sort of organizational structure. So it's really helping to have Massachusetts organizations that deliver community media to be able to do that in an effective way, as well as be the voice to advocate for community media at the state level and subsequently at the national level. Um, because Massachusetts has a unique set of needs, uh, having that strong local organization uh, makes a lot of difference. And it is great to see Mass Access and the ACM working together to further the efforts and the preservation of community media. Public access television is a place for political and philosophical discussions, a spot to view your recorded local government or school board meetings, along with a medium to jumpstart citizen journalism. However, public access television is more than just giving people the opportunity to speak their minds. It is about teaching them as well. I've known of ECAT for many years. Obviously, I know Jason Daniels very well, and, and the staff there are doing a great job. Um, you know, they're one of those, those community media centers that um, I know Jason and the staff there has, has done a lot over the years to help boost the image of Easton um, in the community, on, on community media. They're one of the many success stories that we see in Massachusetts of these community media stations actually making a difference in their community by providing access to training and the channels and in terms of government meetings and what's happening in the schools, sharing that information with the community. So um, ECAD as, is one of those success stories that's doing a great job in informing their community about what's actually happening in Easton. One of my favorite memories is in 2011 at ECAT we had a film sprint 
which was a 48 hour filmmaking challenge. Um, what was so great about it was that it was started by high school students. They came to me with the idea. They helped produce the event. Then when the films were finished, we had a two hour live broadcast of the films um, with bands, uh, with students running all the equipment. Um, it's still one of my favorite moments. It was a really amazing event.